So one homework exercise that I've uh, uh, given you was to try to understand uh, the idea of how come a two churn simon theories, uh, how come a churn simon theory that classically, uh, ostensibly doesn't have a, a time reversal symmetry may acquire time reversal symmetry quantum mechanically. So we discussed that topic. I wanted to just uh, finish that discussion. Um, that's topic number one from yesterday. And the second topic is something that Eliezer brought up that I wanted to mention. Uh, Eliezer's comment. So I want to touch base on these two topics and then uh, uh, proceed to uh, QCD and domain rules in Young Mills theory. So first, uh, does anybody want to uh, perhaps offer uh, what could be the reason that a classical symmetry that's absent could be restored quantum mechanically and why that doesn't happen in general? <coughs> Did anybody think about it? Well, some people asked me during the coffee about it, so I know that some people thought about it. So does anybody want to contribute an idea? Okay, so you, you want to contribute your idea? Yeah, so the point is that in quantum field theory, the classical limit is order one, and then quantum fluctuations are given by an expansion in H bar. And if there is a symmetry here, uh, it can be killed by this term. So in total, there is no symmetry. But in chern simons theory, there is no classical limit when the level is two. The classical space of observables is, uh, uh, is much, much smaller than in, in a typical quantum field theory. The classical set of observables is the space of flat connections. Um, which is a, a space that doesn't have enough degrees of freedom to furnish a classical limit. It's a, a zero dimension. I mean, it's a quantum mechanical space of, uh, of configurations. So in, in chern simons theory, essentially, they, the, the point is that everything is of order H bar. So it's not really correct that classically there is time reversal symmetry. Uh, there isn't cla classically time reversal symmetry. The more correct statement is that the classical limit doesn't exist. So this is comment number one. So let me show you how that works, just as a solution of that homework exercise, since today there won't be a tutorial, and I do want to show you how this works. Yes? In what? In the Schwinger model? No, the Schwinger model does have a classical limit. Because if you take the electrons to be very massive uh, in the Schwinger model, if you take the electrons to be heavy, many phenomena in the Schwinger model are very well approximated by thinking about classical charges. The Schwinger model has a mass parameter, and there is a limit of the model where the mass is very large, and it's the theory is essentially classical. There is also a limit in which the theory is strongly coupled, but the theory still has the propagating degrees of freedom. The, the mass, what? It's the gauge coupling in the Schwinger model. There is a dimensionless, there is a dimensionless coupling in the Schwinger model. That's what Kobe is saying, which is the mass over the, of the, over the gauge coupling. The theory is classical in one limit and strongly interacting in another limit. And of course, in, so the, in the Schwinger model, you have some order one contribution from classical physics. But h bar, is, uh, h bar in the Schwinger model is like e squared over m. So of course, the quantum effects can, uh, as in any uh, strongly interacting quantum field theory, quantum effects can overwhelm the classical contributions at strong coupling when the mass is small or when the electric charge is large. But there is also a classical limit where h bar is small. That's where the mass is very large. So in the Schwinger model, it's not quite like that. chern simons theory doesn't have any limit. chern simons theory at level two doesn't have a parameter that allows you to approximate the theory by its classical limit. OK? Only level two? Uh, no, no, also level three, only, only level four. But uh, the point is that these H bar corrections do not have to conspire in such a way that the theory becomes time reversal invariant. That happens in sparse cases. And level two is a special such case. Any other uh, questions? And then, I, so I want now to show you how this works in U1 level two. It might be, I suspect it will be important for Nati's lectures. And, um, and then I'll get to Eliezer's comment, which will be a brief comment. So U1 level two, we have two anions. One anion has a spin zero, let's call it the unit anion. And the other anion, uh, let's call it E, has a spin, 
uh, which is a, a quarter. Now, the braiding of the anion E around another anion E. Okay, so um, yeah. the braiding of two such anions around each other is given by E to the pi I. That you, that's what you would find if you just plugged into the formulas that I've given you yesterday. That's the braiding of two such anions. And of course, there is no other braiding here because E braiding with one doesn't give you anything. For U1 level minus two, we still, we, we again have one, two anions, one in E prime. And the braiding of E prime around itself. So I'll just draw this again. So the braiding of E prime around itself is given by the formulas that I've given you yesterday by minus e, e to the minus i pi i. And lo and behold, this is the same as that, right? So the braiding matrix agrees. However, there is a small disagreement about the spin. The spin of this is minus a quarter. You, you see that the spins don't quite agree, modulo one. And you can generally measure the spins in TQFT's modulo one. Here, the spins don't agree modulo one, but they do agree modulo a half. So the crude way to say to say that is that this dual this this theories are time reversal invariant only as spin theories as spin TQFTs. In general, U1 level two is defined as a bosonic TQFT because it doesn't have a because it doesn't have a transparent spin, spin a half line. But this duality only holds on spin manifolds or on, on spin TQFTs. And in fact, many of these level rank dualities only hold as spin TQFTs. So the informal way of saying what it means to have a spin TQFT is that we measure the spins more a half. A more precise way to do it is to tensor those theories with uh, uh, trivial theories that have uh, a trivial anion and a spin a half uh, anion, which, has, which is completely transparent. That's a more formal way of doing that. <laughs> so this anion is completely transparent and has a spin a half. This is like the proton that I mentioned yesterday, the proton particle which is represented in the deep infrared by a transparent line with spin a half. So instead of gluing a proton on top of this anion, you can just do it more formally in the language of TQFT like that. So you can tensor both sides with this trivial uh, proton if you want. And then the mapping is that E goes to Psi, E prime goes to E Psi, and E goes to Psi prime times E prime. So you can tensor these uh, anions with the uh, protons, so to speak. again? Yes, spin a half fermion, correct. So the mapping is not that E goes to E prime under time reversal. This is crudely correct. The more precise way of saying it is that E goes to psi prime times E prime. And psi prime is like a proton that you attach to the anion. It's completely transparent. All, all it does is to change the spin by a half. So crudely, you could say that you measure the spin mod a half, even though it's not rigorously correct. That's not how it works if you define everything uh, mathematically rigorously. Mathematically rigorously, this is how it works. You just need to modify U1 level two slightly so that it's a spin theory, and then the duality holds. There is a true mapping of the anions. And the spin is measured mod one. Yep. Exactly. So you see that E psi has the same spin as E prime modulo one. If, so the spin of E psi is a quarter plus a half. A quarter plus a half is uh, three quarters. Now you flip three quarters. That's minus three quarters. This has a quarter. And minus three quarters and a quarter is the same mod modulo one. So the, the whole idea is indeed that you have to flip the spin. If you don't flip the spin, it doesn't work. So we flip the spin. We tensor it with this uh, proton bound, the proton that's attached to an anion, and then it works. OK, so the duality holds only a spin TQFT is not as ordinary bosonic TQFTs. That means that if you study this theory on arbitrary bosonic manifolds, the dual, they would not be time reversal invariant, only on spin, spin manifolds. OK, uh, the next thing that I wanted to touch base on is something that Eliezer brought to my attention, which I wasn't aware of. And so we discussed yesterday the fact that uh, in generic systems, when you heat them up, the symmetries are restored. And indeed, this is what happens in superconductors. If you heat up a superconductor, then uh, I the superconductivity is destroyed. You go to a nor normal phase, uncondensed, non-condensed phase. If you, heat up a, if you heat up a magnet, it goes to a disordered phase where all the spins are randomly uh, 
randomly pointing in various directions and the SL3 symmetry is restored. Or, I don't know, there are lots, if you heat up a solid, then the translational sy symmetry is recovered, right? When you go to a gas, gaseous phase. But it appears that there is a <laughs> counterexample with some, uh, some salt. I, don't, I forgot the name of the salt. Rochelle. Rochelle. The, sol, the salt of Rochelle, it's some kind of weird material that has a broken symmetry even at high temperatures. And I don't completely understand how this is, could even be. So I have to think about it. So we can. <laughs> Yeah, 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 it's a Lando so Ginsburg potential. That's why I'm, I'm not sure it's a In fact, last year with Max Metlitsky, we came up with a proof that for Lando Ginsburg models it cannot happen. So I'm very puzzled so now. So these are various pressure exchange models uh, where uh, some kind of more regular arrangement has a larger entropy of fluctuations. It's just a Lando Ginsburg model. It's a 5 to the 4 model. Yeah, that's right. No, no, no. The whole point is that this happens asymptotically. Yes, that's the whole point. Otherwise, of course, I would not, it would not contradict what I said. What I said yesterday is that as, at asymptotically high temperatures, the symmetries must be restored. And I even had the proof of that last year, which we didn't publish. But now, so you believe. <laughs> but there is a counterexample. Weinberg has shown that if you heat up this system, asymptotically there is a, this, there is a ordered phase. I, I don't understand how this can be. It, it contradicts. Wrong example, it contradicts what I knew. Yeah. It, and Weinberg doesn't make mistakes, so <laughs> we have to. So we have to. I have to think about it. But there is there, there is some tension of between what I said, Subir's intuition or knowledge and well, a proof that I had last year. Yes. No, no. This is not the case here. This is not the case. It's a perfectly regular Lando Ginzburg model with some O-N symmetry, with some, and Weinberg proves that at infinite temperature it's ordered. I don't understand how this can be, but I already said that, so. Anyway, uh, he, he even says that all macroscopic systems other than this uh, are or disordered at high temperatures. So th this appears like, like some kind of uh, outlaw. I don't understand it very well, so. Any other questions before we jump back in? Yeah, this would be interesting to understand. I wasn't aware of that. And I don't believe it, but uh, this I'll have to understand it over the weekend. So, so let's go back to Young Mills. We discussed the pure SUN gauge theory. We discussed the phase diagram of pure SUN, SUN gauge theory as a function of the temperature and the theta angle. And the idea was that there are two phase transitions, which have to look like that. So here, time reversal symmetry is restored. And here, the, and here there is deconfinement. So here, the ZN symmetry is a, a broken. Here, the ZN symmetry is respected. And here, the CP symmetry, or time reversal symmetry, is broken. And above that uh, special temperature, it's, uh, it's obeyed. And you can prove using anomalies that this intersection has to take place. Cannot be that, it, uh, that this line ends before that line. And there is a similar claim for uh, adjoint, the, a super Young theory, which is SUN gauge theory with an adjoint fermion. Now, the thing that I want to start discussing today, that the first thing that I want to discuss today is a uh, something that actually somebody asked about last time, which is uh, how do you measure this twofold degeneracy at uh, theta equals pi? So I want to talk a little bit about the domain wall that you would form if you were to be able to simulate it on the lattice. And then we'll discuss QCD. Since uh, uh, Slava I was asking uh, yesterday about what happens if you add fermions, so I, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about what happens when you add fermions. Yes, yes, the, there is some, con so it's a very, uh, indeed, thank you for the question. So here the claim is the time reversal symmetry is spontaneously broken. Uh, ju that just means that there is an order parameter that, take that, op that has a VEV, and the order parameter is the epsilon mu nu rho sigma trace F mu nu F rho sigma. 
So that quantity must have a vacuum expectation value at theta equals pi. And since it's time reversal symmetry odd, that would lead to a twofold degenerate ground state. So that's the condensate that you have to go after. Now I want to discuss a little bit the domain wall. Yes. Yeah, this is just saying that there is confinement. <coughs> confinement means that the Wilson loops have an area law, and therefore the one-form symmetry is unbroken. While deconfinement means that the Wilson loops are a sub-area, I mean, maybe <coughs> perimeter or something like that, and then the symmetry is broken. The one-form symmetry is an order parameter for confinement, deconfinement. It's broken at high temperatures and unbroken at low temperatures, which is the opposite from w the way ordinary symmetries behave. Uh, this, uh, no, this can, this can. This one, you mean this yeah, transition? Yeah. This transition can be described by a Landau Ginzburg model <coughs> in three dimensions, not in four dimensions. You have to think about the circle, which describes the temperature, and then you have an effective three dimensional model. And that transition is just the ordinary ZN restoration transition. And it's typically first order, except in some special cases where it's actually second order. And there we even know that it's in the Ising universality class. Continuous sizing universality class. Yeah, so we this 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 is perfectly Landau Ginzburg, but you no, know, at finite temperature, sort of. So in three dimensions rather than in four dimensions. It's sort of morally Landau Ginzburg in four dimensions, right? Well, in Landau Ginzburg, this cannot be described by any Landau Ginzburg model in four dimensions because Landau Ginzburg models cannot have one form symmetries. Yeah, yeah, but it's some generalization of Landau Ginzburg. It's yeah, like perhaps. Something like that, yeah. yeah. Uh, any other? Okay, so we have to. I want to discuss now this uh, situation that we've encountered at theta equals pi, where we have two ground states that are related by time reversal symmetry, and I want to discuss the perhaps uh, hypothetical but sort of important question of what happens if we were to arrange the following situation. Let's call these two vacua 1 and 2. And you would arrange on the lattice that somebody in the future will construct um, the boundary conditions that the theory approaches vacuum number 1 to the far left and vacuum number 2 to the far right. It's a canonical setup that we study in every situation where there is symmetry breaking. So the theory then forms some energy density uh, somewhere in the middle, which is called the domain wall. This domain wall must exist since it needs to separate the two vacua. <laughs> So the domain wall is just an object that's kind of quasi called dimension one. It has some it has some finite width on the in, in practice, but if we go to deep low energies, it looks like a two plus one dimensional wall. Uh, and there is some physics on that two plus one dimensional wall. So that's the general thing that you find if you construct domain walls between vacua. <laughs> you get a one dimensional lower object that has some degrees of freedom on it. So we wa I want to tell you what happens on this domain wall, which is very exotic. So this domain wall is made out of pure glue. I mean, the field theory that we've got is just pure young mills theory. So the content of the domain wall is just something that's made out of pure glue. And this is a very esoteric, this is a very, uh, esoteric phase of pure glue, uh, which I want to explain. It's not an ordinary phase of pure glue, uh, of pure glue. So let's, let me try to describe the phenomenology of that phase. Uh, I won't give you derivations akin to how I've been doing these lectures uh, before, uh, also previously. I, I'll just give you sort of the intuition and, and the answers. So each of these vacua uh, is confining. Uh, as you can see, the uh, electric one form symmetry is unbroken everywhere below the deconfinement transition by definition. So each of these vacua is still confining. So if you put a probe quark, so let Q and Q bar be probe quarks and uh, quark and anti-quarks. So to describe them formally, you have to put the Wilson line that runs in time. But I'm just giving you a snapshot in time. So the quarks and anti-quarks look like points. Uh, these are infinitely, ma infinitely massive probe particles. So we know very well that if you put such a quark and anti-quark, they get connected by what? 
how is this object called? Interesting. Yeah, flux tube. It's, these are external quarks, so these flux tubes are uh, completely stable and rigorously defined because you cannot create quarks from the vacuum to screen those flux tubes. And similarly, in vacuum number one, there is a flux tube. So let's do the following Gedanken experiment. Let's try to take one of those flux tubes and bring it near the, the domain wall. I mean, it's a physical experiment you can do on the lattice. Once you have this configuration, you could construct a Wilson loop and just bring it closer to the domain wall. So the thing that, the thing that happens on the domain wall is the following. So it turns out, I want, I'll give you the intuition in a second. I'll give you the physical intuition for what I'm saying in a second. But it turns out that on the wall, the flux tube melts. The flux tube disappears. So the flux tube sort of melts and dissolves or disappears or dissolves, maybe a better, a better word. What does it mean formally? Well, the reason that the flux tube merge, so the, the physical uh, reason is that, what is the actual difference between vacuum number one and vacuum number two other than time reversal, other than that they are connected by time reversal symmetry? Loosely speaking, here the monopoles condense. And as you remember, monopole condensation leads to confinement and to the formation of flux tubes. In this vacuum, however, uh, it's the time reversal image of the monopole that condenses. Now, the time reversal image of the monopole is a dion because of the Witten effect. So here, the, what condenses is a dion rather than a monopole. This is called the Witten effect. That if you act with time reversal symmetry on a monopole at eta equals pi, you get a, a dion rather than a time reversed monopole. So here there is a condensation of a dion, and here there is a condensation of a monopole. So how do you interpolate between these two situations? The best way is to let the monopole and the dion be uncondensed here, right? So if you imagine that these are some profiles of condensates, on the domain wall, the condensates will both vanish. They have no choice. So on the wall, on the wall there is no monopole or dion condensation. <coughs> There is no monopole or dion condensation, and therefore you have deconfinement. So therefore you, you find deconfinement on the wall. So deconfinement means that the flux tube is dissolved. Instead of, being, instead of the glue flux being uh, inside a flux tube, it's completely dissolved in space. So when you put these probe quarks on the wall, they don't talk to each other through a flux tube. In, so rather, they, the, the flux is sort of dissolved on the wall. Okay, there is, the theory is deconfined. Now, you can say much more. It turns out that something even more exotic takes place on the wall. So first of all, the, there is deconfinement on the wall. That's part one of the phenomenology of these domain walls. And you can sort of experimentally in the future <laughs> see it by uh, looking at the properties of Wilson lines that are supported on the wall. The other thing that's more exotic is that these quarks uh, start their life as external particles of integer or half integer spin. So the quarks Q uh, start their life, they start their life as ordinary particles, external particles in three plus one dimensions, as ordinary uh, probe particles, probe uh, particles in uh, three plus one dimensions. And as such, their spin is in a representation of SU2, and therefore it's either integer or half integer. So their spin is a, a half integer or integer. The thing that happens when you bring those quarks to the wall uh, is that they acquire an ionic nature. And that's why I gave you an introduction to Chern Simon's theory yesterday. So they become anions. So our beloved familiar quarks. Uh, suddenly uh, have this flux attachment and they become anions exactly through the mechanism that I described yesterday. So what happens is that these quarks on the wall become like our anions and if you braid them through each other you find interesting aharon of bomb phases. So this is a non-trivial deconfined phase 
where the quarks become anions. What happens if one is outside, left outside, and one inside? Yeah, so there will be a flux tube that ends on the wall. So this fla you can think about this wall as a deep brain on which flux tubes can end. So there is a configuration that looks like a wall on which a flux tube can end. What would be the force between the two? What would be the well, the flux tube still is going to carry some tension while it's outside of the wall. Yeah. So you can think about it as a D2 brain. And this is an F1. So the what happens on this wall, it's very similar to string theory. And uh, the wall volume theory of this D brain has a chern simons uh, term. And that's exactly how you account for the fact that these quarks become anions. So what I'm saying, uh, in, you can recast it. Aliens, right? hmm? no, no, a, billion a billion. So they happen to be a billion in this case, but there are other cases where there are non a billion. In SUN gauge theory, uh, it turns out that this, okay, I'll, I'll write the phenomenology now. Uh, let g just give me a second. Should I erase that? Yeah. Which hmm? from Yeah, that's what I'm going to tell you now. I'm going to tell you which anions do they become. So what, what, what one, what one finds is that the spin of the fundamental quark, like the probe particle in the fundamental representation of the gauge group, the spin becomes 1 over 2n. And therefore, we can identify the world volume theory, the world volume theory uh, on, on the domain wall with u1 level what? Who remembers the formula from yesterday? Does anybody remember? U1 level N. N is the gauge group. No, N is the rank of the gauge group. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <coughs> exactly. So this is the, so the cast of characters on this domain wall is that it's like, it's a similar theory. If you've ever seen the world volume theory of deep brains in string theory, it's very similar. Uh, there is a gauge field on this deep brain, which has a chern simons term. And uh, the physical interpretation is that quarks, external probe quarks, become anions and pick up our of bomb phases and they're deconfined. So what does it mean when you go to large and limit that the spin technically? Yeah, the, this spin is defined modulo one. Because you can always attach to this uh, uh, probe quark a raw meson. Doesn't doesn't cost anything, or, or a global better a global. The spin goes to zero in large n, no? That's right. The spin goes to zero at large n, modulo one. So yeah, the spin is only defined modulo one because you can attach to any such any such uh, probe quark a uh, global of spin one. So the spin is not inherently defined. It's only defined modulo one. Uh, well, there is a, it's a little bit. Uh, it kind of emerges out of the quarks, like CPM or something. Uh, I, I don't know how to distinguish emergent from fundamental. One point of view is that it's basically the original gauge field, which is now deconfined. Uh, another point of view is that it's an emergent gauge field. But can I think of it as being sort of the quarks as being sort of the constituents, like in a CPM model? No, the quarks here are probe particles. And this theory exists regardless of the quarks. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. This is an effective field theory on the wall at the low in the low energy limit, where the wall looks like a co-dimension to co-dimension one object in the theory. The edge? What do you mean the edge here, like? I mean, or just if you go away? Yeah, in physically, of course, the wall has some kind of a uh, little fuzzy. It's fuzzy on the scale of the QCD, strong coupling scale. But if you perform experiments on distance scales which are much bigger, for instance, you can t take two probe quarks, uh, bring them near the wall, and braid them. And you can do this braiding on a scale of like the galaxy. So you won't see the little width, width the fact that the, the wall has some little widths, you don't care. So you can describe the braiding phases as a two plus one dimensional effective field theory. That effective field theory turns out to be U1 level and Chern Simons theory. Sorry, sorry. So these open strings that are attached to the brain are dynamical or not? D yes, the open strings are dynamical, but their endpoints are not. Okay, maybe that's what's confusing me. So, so the idea is you have configurations where you just attach a string at a definite, two definite points? 
No, the the objects that you uh, put in yeah. are the world lines of some probe quarks. Yeah. So if you if those world lines happen to coincide with the location of the world, yeah. you can then braid these world lines, and you'll find macroscopic Aharon of bound phases. Yeah, yeah, but they're not. But the, those, but those, those. However, if you braided them outside of the world, you would find is zero. You would find an exponential of minus the distance. No, th this is also dynamical because this breaks translational invariance, the and therefore there are phonons here. Is the gate field is dynamical? Oh yes, this gate field is definitely dynamical. That's why it leads to non-trivial Aharon of bound phases. It has spin stored in this gate field. It has, uh, if you if there was a boundary, there will be propagating modes of on the boundary. It's a uh, yeah. The gate field is dynamical. The probe quarks are not. So what happens to the other gate fields? Which other gate fields are confined? No, they disappear. Well, there is an identity that we discussed yesterday, uh, level rank duality, which is that this is the same as SUN level minus one, so, which is also an abelian TQFT. It has abelian anions. Does it hold also if you have an S quotum? Yes. Yes, this is the deep low energy description of the theory. At deep low energies, uh, the only degrees of freedom that, uh, that you've got are these probe quarks and their macroscopic aharon of bomb phases and their fusion and braiding. And that's what is described by U1 level N. There is no f square term because uh, macroscopically, the only things that exist are this Aron of bomb phases. No, no, the f square term would just mean that you know there is some maybe massive spin one uh, photon, but it would not be in any sense a degree of freedom of the wall at low energies. It will be very heavy. Its mass is going to be like n lambda squared typically. The object that you are talking about will be very heavy. N lambda, sorry. Well, that is only if you don't have the meson condensation. But there is no, I'm just telling you, uh, there is no mesons here. I'm talking about pure Young-Mills theory. We will soon discuss uh, a QCD, and you'll see that, in fact, on the wall, when these quarks become light and dynamical, they can condense, and then the dynamics on the wall can be far much more interesting. Uh, that's what I'm aiming at. I want to tell you the answer when these quarks become dynamical. What happens to this TQFT? Yeah. Yes? Oh, uh, Shmuel, asking, Shmuel is asking about what happens to this whole story when you crank up the temperature. Uh, there is lots of recent work on that. In particular, if you're interested, you can look at papers of uh, Eric Poppitz uh, and others. I can, if you want, I can send you all the references. But people have studied, uh, people have, so this survives for some finite range of temperatures because it's topological. But then at some point, you cross the deconfinement phase and then the wall becomes confining, I think, as far as I remember. <laughs> so there is confinement on the wall at high temperatures, if I remember correctly. Yeah. The, you can estimate the tension. You cannot compute it from first principles. At least I don't know how to. The tension of this D2 brain uh, scales like n uh, lambda cubed. But I cannot compute the prefactor here. Yeah. You can compute it in string theory. There is actually a very uh, clear embedding of this whole story in string theory. I can say it in two sentences. You start from the Witten's model for non-supersymmetric Young-Mills theory. And it turns out that this object is a D6 brain that's wrapped on a fourth sphere. And you can prove this assertion in string theory by integrating the wesumino witten term over the fourth sphere. So these things can be uh, corroborated by holography. In this theory, there, are, there is just one. But in more complicated situations, there are many. And in particular, uh, coming back to Shmuel's question, uh, when you cross the deconfinement transition, there are n different, at least n distinct types of walls. And people have started analyzing them. Any other questions? Yes? Say again, I just couldn't hear. Oh, very good. Yeah, you're asking about changing the representations of the quarks. So here I just told you the spin of the quark, the fundamental quark, the probe <laughs> fundamental quark, when you bring it to the wall. But you could study probe quarks in arbitrary representations R. So let's imagine that we have a quark in an arbitrary representation R. 
And we can represent this rep irreducible representation of SUN. You can think about it as a young tableau. In that young tableau, you count the boxes. Is that okay? <coughs> and the spin of that quark is going to be the number of boxes squared over 2n. If the number of boxes is 0 mod n, then this is either a half integer or an integer. And that anion would be trivial. So you get non-trivial anions on the wall only if the number of boxes is not divisible by n. Which is, intuitively, which is intuitive, because if the number of boxes is divisible by n, you can screen it out by a, a gluon. Can you do? Yes, but not in SUN gauge theory. There are other examples where you can get non-abelian gauge theories. On. For example, in s if you take the symplectic group, it turns out that the theory in the world is non-abelian. Yes. You're asking what is the answer for the symplectic group? Yes, so. For the symplectic group, the answer is uh, SU2 level n. Which is non abelian theory. Okay. Can you still, uh, basically, what I'm asking is that can you get a transcendent, which is like SU, N at level K, or N and K, both are Yes, but you will have to complicate the setup a little bit. I'm just giving you the simplest possible setup. If you complicate the setup just a little bit, you can get uh, SU and level <coughs> K on the wall. Any other questions before I go to the... The next thing is obviously to ask what happens if these quarks uh, become dynamical. They can fluctuate. So that's what I want to tell you next. Then there are uh, some interesting phenomena that have to do with condensation of quarks. Condensation of anions in 2 plus 1 dimensions. And uh, this brings us uh, towards uh, the topic that Nari will discuss, which is 2 plus 1 dimensional dynamics. <coughs> so some interesting 2 plus 1 dimensional dynamics takes place on the wall in young mills theory. That's how these topics co make contact with each other. Okay, so the next topic is fluctuating quarks. Fluctuating fundamental quarks. So first, before, I, before we study this, we, I have to remind you of some properties of QCD. So we take the Lagrangian to be the ordinary uh, four, 3 plus 1 dimensional Lagrangian that has the fermions. I'll just quickly remind you of, the, of, some, in, of some important things. Um, So there are several important things about this, uh, this theory that uh, I need to remind you of <coughs> regarding uh, this mass and whether it's complex or real, stuff like that. And also, I, didn't, I did not write a theta term on purpose. I did not write a, ter a theta term on purpose. In the pure Yang mills case, it was very important to write a theta term uh, to capture these things. but here I didn't write it for the following reason. There is the famous axial, there is a famous axial anomaly, uh, which as I explained is not an anomaly. It's just like I'm kind of a redundancy in, the redundancy in your description in this case. Uh, and what it means is the following. What it means is that uh, M is generally a complex parameter. And if you allow for M to be a general complex parameter, you don't need a theta term. Because if you were to put a theta term, you could make a change of variables, which is a chiral transformation, removing the theta term and putting the phase into the mass. So if you want, we will use the following parameterization to remove any sort of ambiguity. The mass is going to be some <laughs> real non-negative, uh, going to have some real non-negative piece, 
which I'm going to call the absolute value of m. And the phase is related to the theta angle in this fashion, where nf is the number of quarks. So i runs from 1 to nf. We have to sum over i, and i runs from 1 to nf. This is the number of quarks. And I've taken their mass to be completely degenerate. So just for simplicity, I assume that all the quarks have exactly the same mass, so that we have the maximal possible symmetry, which is SUNF. So our global symmetry is just SUNF times U1 baryon. I've taken the quarks to be completely <coughs> degenerate. And uh, the theta parameter is encoded in the phase of this complex parameter ma of the mass. Are there any questions about it? Are you familiar with this fact? No? Yes? Yes? Yes, I'm assuming that the mass is a unit matrix in flavor space. So all the quarks have exactly the same mass. And um, are, are, so uh, do I need to explain that? Does I raise your hand if you want to hear why this. OK, so there is overwhelming demand here. So let's consider the following transformation. Let's consider the following trans transformation of the, of the Lagrangian. So classically, what does this transformation do? Just classically. Classically, it keeps the kinetic terms invariant, right? It keeps this term invariant, but it changes the mass. So this transformation changes the mass by m going to m times e to the 2i alpha. Is this clear? However, this transformation famously does not leave the measure invariant, <coughs> right? And the measure, the, measure, the measure transforms into something which, is re which has a phase. So let, me, so let me just remind you of the transformation of the measure. So the measure of the over the fermions is not invariant under this transformation, surprisingly. You cannot define QCD with the measure that's invariant under this transformation. So the measure transforms by a phase. And this was uh, computed by Fuji Fujikawa. And uh, you can prove that this is exact to all orders. This is not a one loop result. It's exact. So uh, to all orders in the uh, gauge coupling. So he found that the measure transforms to i over 8 pi squared. And then I need an f times 2 alpha, uh, and f times 2 alpha, and if alpha is pi, then I get 2 pi, that's OK, times an integral of f trace f wedge f. And f is the number of uh, quarks in the fundamental representation, which is also the number of quarks in the anti-fundamental representation. So if you had the standard model with three generations, it would be three. Uh, so this is the formula of Fujikawa. You can find it in books. It's a standard thing. So you see that what it does is to shift the theta parameter by an f times 2 alpha. And therefore, shifting the theta parameter and shifting the phase of the mass is the same thing. So you can, without loss of generality, remove the theta parameter at the expense of having a non-trivial phase for the mass. Okay, so that's what the origin of this uh, story. So tell you how many you don't need; you choose. <coughs> Here, an f is the number is the parameter, and I'm just parameterizing the, 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 the I'm just parameterizing the theory. These are the these are the objects that the phase diagram of the theory depends on. Okay. So let me just remind you of some uh, basic. Uh, so I'm going to uh, give. I'm going to plot two things. I'm going to plot the dependence of the theory on the absolute value of the mass for theta equals zero, and then uh, I'll and then I'll do a similar plot here of the phases of the theory as a function of the mass for theta equals pi. Okay. I'm not going to give you uh, the full thing in the complex plane. That will be hard to draw, and it has some features. So let's start at theta equals zero. It's very large mass. What does QCD do? You just integrate out the quarks. Theta is 0. So you just get nothing, a trivially gapped vacuum. 
trivial gap vacuum. A unique, unique trivial gap vacuum. Okay. Now, as you lower the mass, we cannot prove it, but most people would say that nothing happens until you reach zero, at which point there are massless Goldstone bosons. However, okay, this is, is this okay? This is the standard picture for what happens in QCD with positive masses for the quarks. Now, if you take theta equals pi, the, the quarks have some phases, and you can ask a similar question. So what happens when we integrate out the quarks here? We remove the quarks, but theta is now pi. And what happens in theta equals pi? We just said we have two vacua. So here we have two vacua. And again, we would say that the same thing continues to be true all the way to zero, at which point it's the same physics. So we have massless number Goldstone bosons. But here we have two vacua. So therefore, we have an interesting question to pose now. We can ask, what is the theory on the two plus one dimensional domain wall that, um, that we've studied before? <coughs> one day when they can simulate it on the lattice, we can check if, uh, if uh, what we're going to say about this is true. So we can really, we can really analyze now the domain wall theory in this limit, because it's not very different from pure Young Mills, and, we can use, and then we can ask what happens when we lower the mass. So my goal is to just give you an answer for what happens to, domain, to the domain wall as a function of this mass. Notice a very important thing, that in the bulk, like in three plus one dimensions, there is no phase transition until you hit zero. It seems that it's the same, it's smooth. However, that doesn't mean that there is no phase transition on the wall. There could be something happening on the wall while the bulk is completely smooth. Hey, sorry, just to be clear, so, I mean, at least naively, it seems somewhat strange that, you know, the a limit of something where there's a unique vacuum is equal to the limit of something where there's two vacua. So presumably that's because in the Goldstone boson phase, there's a continuous... Be, there's a second order phase transition here. Yeah, yeah, and so then these two become some it, subset. This is, like the, uh, this is like the continuous sizing transition. It's a little similar. There are two vacuum on one side, one vacuum on the other side, and there is a second order phase transition in the middle. So the massless number Goldstone bosons implement a continuous phase transition between these two phases. And the universality class of this phase transition is boring. It's just three fields, five to the four. You have decoupled it from the issue of confinement. There is no confinement, rigorously speaking. But it still makes sense to ask, what is the theory in the wall? Why does it make sense? Because we have two vacua. Every time we have two vacua, we can ask, what is the low energy theory in the wall? So the limit, again, rigorously speaking, there is no confinement because confinement is a question about very big, big Wilson loops. So you take two, well, confinement is a question about probe particles, which are very well separated. Uh, so, so confinement is a question about what happens if you introduce two external heavy quarks, not the dynamical quarks that I've used here, two heavy external quarks, and you ask whether they form a flux tube. But for large enough separations, it's always energetically favorable to create from the vacuum two dynamical quarks, which have finite mass, not infinite mass, snap the string, this is called string snapping, and then there is no obstruction for it to decay and you get two mesons, <coughs> probe mesons, sort of. So there is no rigorous, there you cannot rigorously form an arbitrarily large string. You can form somewhat large strings uh, when the mass is big enough. So you can st still, still see it on the lattice if the mass is big enough, but you cannot rigorously form infinitely long strings. So the purists would say that confinement is an ill-defined concept now. But in practice, of course, confinement is uh, an important concept because we don't see free quarks. It still takes infinite energy to separate quarks from each other in any practical sense. <coughs> okay. Um, okay, so with we are studying the model at theta equals pi, namely when the quark masses have this funny phase, e to the i pi over n f. And we take M to be very, very large. So what is the theory on the domain wall? 
the theory of the domain world, what is it going to be? Does anybody have a guess? Yes? OK, yeah. Well, I would prefer the students to make their guesses. But it has to be U1 level N churn simons theory at low energies. Why? Because it's a topological field theory. That's the, ho the hallmark of topology. The topology cannot disappear due to small, small uh, corrections. The fact that the quarks are dynamical is great, but they're heavy. So we can integrate them out. And there are only small corrections to pure Young-Mills theory. And so you cannot destroy the topological nature of the infrared uh, by small corrections to the action. Well, you can make it more precise. If you wanted to run this argument rigorously, you would say that this leads to a vacuum degeneracy when you put the theory in a torus. And that vacuum degeneracy is an integer. It cannot change by small corrections to the kinetic term or higher order corrections to the uh, kinetic terms. Uh, like th things like f to the 4 and so on. They cannot change the vacuum degeneracy on a torus. So. so the U1 level n cannot be destroyed. But intuitively, yeah. Yes? Not many. I have. I assume that an f is uh, like three. No, that's uh, why I chose this parameterization. I chose this parameterization. This parameterization is chosen in such a way that when I integrate them out, you get pure Young-Mills theory with state equals pi. That's your effective theory. Okay. So then you have two vacua, and you can construct a domain world. <coughs> but that theory is so close to pure Young-Mills that it cannot change the, the topological nature of the ground state. So you still get U1 level n. Exactly. Generally, integrating out quarks with arbitrary complex masses leads to some shift of the theta angle. But I've chosen my parameterization in such a way that I land on my feet. OK? Now, the domain world theory is therefore U1 level n churn Simon's theory for large enough masses. But we can ask, is it still true? But now, intuitively, uh, intuitively, now we have, we have charged anions, charged dynamical anions. Previously, the anions were probe particles that we brought from infinity that had charge 1 under the U1 gauge symmetry. But now, there are dynamical uh, anions. So they can fluctuate. Here, they are still heavy. But they can already fluctuate a little bit. Plus dynamical, dynamical charge particles. But they're heavy. Heavy dynamical charge particles. Now we're going to lower the mass of the quarks and see whether these particles will do something interesting, these anions. And we'll see that there is, in fact, anion condensation. Now let me prove to you that there is anion condensation. So surprisingly, this can be proven. And it's a very cute classical computation. So I'm going to do some computation in classical physics that could have been done 60 years ago or 50 years ago. Uh, and I'm going to try to compute explicitly the domain world theory in this region. <laughs> so in this region, you can try to find explicitly this U1 level n. Why? Because in this region, the physics in the bulk is well approximated by the number Goldson bosons. And therefore, we can explicitly construct this domain wall and see what are the low energy degrees of freedom on this domain wall. OK, so we can do a classical computation now, acute classical computation. You assume that the domain wall is uh, homogeneous. There, there is a substructure in the domain wall. What, you you there would be layers. Some finite width, width, that's what you mean, or which layers? Mm -hmm. What do you mean by layers? Well, there would be different regions on the domain wall. Uh, that's but what is the region? Well, in, in terms of what condenses in the uh, I don't completely understand. Well, I, think I remember that in the, in the supersymmetric case, this, uh, then when one constructs this domain wall, then there are several layers you know, that interpolate between the two sides. And you mean that it will fracture into several domain walls? It could be dynamically that the wall fractures into several ones. No, no, no. That simply the domain wall has an inner structure. Oh, yeah. There is an, I there is an inner structure also here. It has something to do with an esoteric configuration of glue that leads to this deconfinement. But this uh, in internal structure is not known. What I'm telling you is the effective theory on the wall. I'm not giving you a solution. 
I'm not giving you the full glue configuration, the glue wave function. But you can approximate it by the Laughlin wave function. That's the whole point. So we have some good understanding of the wave function of the glue near this world because it's the same as the fractional quantum Hall effect. It's U1 level N. Um, okay, so let's do a computation. It's a classical physics computation uh, at small masses. So what are the degrees of freedom at small masses? These are the pseudo number Goldstone bosons. I say pseudo because I'm going to be somewhere here. I'm not going to be at zero mass. I don't want to go all the way to zero mass. It's a singular limit where there are infinitely many vacua other than two vacua. And the concept of domain world is, is slightly less well defined. So I want to be somewhere here where there are two vacua and compute the domain world theory. So the Lagrangian is going to be du, du minus 1, f pi squared. This is the kinetic term uh, for the number Goldstone bosons, where u is an S, u, and f matrix. So we have pions. Uh, this you can also write as an exponential of the pions. We have an f squared minus 1 pions. And this is the degree of, these are the degrees of freedom uh, at small masses. Now you have to put in the mass, because we're here, not to the massless limit. And the way to put in the mass, there is a trace here. The way to put in the mass is to, tr is to write plus m. Now I have to remember this uh, funny phase. This will be absolutely crucial. Trace of u plus the complex conjugate. So this is the Carl Lagrangian description of being here. If you were here, which is the more standard thing to study, which is what you find in books like Weinberg's book, you would not put this funny phase. But with the funny phase, you can describe this region. That's on the other side of the transition. So let's try to minimize this action. Now it's all classical physics, group manifolds. It's very easy. Let's write the potential. Let's start. Hmm? This is the three plus one dimensional bulk action. We're going to try to just verify as a sanity check that it has two ground states. And then we'll construct the interpolating solution. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, as, I mean, you're just trolling me. You know the answer, right? Uh, this is like a lambda cubed and n. Yeah. There's a, I, I'm, I'm keeping factors of n, but I, I really shouldn't. Should I keep factors of n or you don't care? Let me remove it. And I'll just remove that and put lambda squared. OK? So yeah. Yeah, great. I have just enough time to finish that exercise. So this is the theory. And we need to minimize the potential. So u is an, a general SUNF matrix. u is a general SUNF matrix. So uh, when you look for minima, for this kind of potential, you have to try to have an educated guess of what kind of matrices could minimize this potential. Now, we don't expect that we expect two isolated vacua from this picture. And therefore, these matrices cannot break SUNF spontaneously. This theory has an SUNF global symmetry, which acts on you by conjugation. Notice the SUNF global symmetry, which acts on you by conjugation. Do you see that this is the symmetry? Because the trace is invariant. And this is invariant. And we don't expect that this symmetry will be spontaneously broken by the vacuum, because otherwise this picture would not be right. You'll have like uh, some like <coughs> infinitely many vacua here, rather than just two. And we don't quite expect that. So therefore, we have to shoot uh, at trying to minimize this potential with a matrix that's invariant under conjugation. Which matrices are invariant under conjugation? Uh, matrices that are proportional to the scalar identity matrix, right? So. We have to uh, look for SUNF matrices that are proportional to the identity matrix. But these are SUNF matrices, so they have to have determinant 1. And this, therefore, fixes the phase to be something like 2 pi i L over an F times the identity matrix. And L is an integer. So these are the only diagonal uh, matrices in SUNF that would uh, not break SUNF global symmetry. OK? And L is an integer. So we have to minimize over an integer, which is much easier than to minimize over a group mi manifold. And then, of course, you can try to prove at home. It's a small exercise that I did not really make a mistake. You can try to prove that this potential is indeed minimized 
by configurations that are diagonal. You can try to prove it. It's not too hard. It's just a small exercise on group manifolds. So with this, we have to minimize over L over the integer L. So L is not really an integer. It's defined as an integer mod an F. Because like, as you can see, if you, if you put L equals an F, then this matrix is the same as the L equals 0 matrix. So we just plug those diagonal matrices into the potential. And uh, yeah, so we plug that into the potential. And we find that the potential is minus cosine L. So let me not make a mistake. L over an F, 2 pi L over an F. Uh, minus pi over an f. So that's the potential that we find. Minus cosine of, of 2 pi. Up to these uh, numerical factors. So up to some uh, positive numerical factors that uh, take care of the dimensions. So where are the minima of this cosine? The cosine wants to be as close as possible to 0 for minus cosine to be at the minimum. So you can try to put L equals to 0. That looks good. Or you can try to put L equals 1. In fact, it gives the same answer. So as you can see, L equals 0 and L equals 1 give the exact same answer for the energy. And the other values of L give a higher energy. So they're not minima. So therefore, we see the two, that there are two minima. One has to do with the matrix e to the 2 pi i over an f, the unit matrix. And the other is the unit matrix. So we have two minima, and they are related by time reversal symmetry. So we've uh, vindicated our uh, prejudice that there are two vacua at small mass. And it seems, therefore, continuously connected to the large mass picture. So there seems to be nothing going on in the bulk. Okay, But now we have to construct an interpolating solution between these two vacua. That's like a domain wall solution. But why did you do a uh, Because I'm at finite n. Great question. Uh, there are many papers about it by now. I won't discuss it here. Okay. <laughs> I mean, once you understand the idea, you could do it yourself in an afternoon. It's classical physics. It's not, it's not so hard, yeah? So we need to now try to understand the theory on the domain wall. We've uh, vindicated our picture of the bulk, but now we want to construct an interpolating solution between these two matrices. Okay, so this is some configuration of the U field. We have some configuration of the U field as a function of Z. Z is this coordinate. And U is a matrix in S, U, and F. So previously, I made a very big deal of the fact that I wanted the U matrix to be diagonal so that SU and F symmetry is unbroken. <coughs> so the bulk indeed has only two vacua, which are trivially gapped. Each is trivially gapped. But can you interpolate between these two matrices in the group manifold w w without breaking the symmetry? Is it possible to interpolate between these two matrices while staying on the diagonal, while remaining SU and F invariant? Is it possible? No. Everybody's shaking their head. So no, the answer is, of course, no. So therefore, it's imperative <coughs> that on the domain wall, there will be trapped massless fields. So even though the bulk is massive, it seems that at some point, the U1 level end story must break down, and there will be trapped massless fields on the wall. And we'll interpret it soon as uh, due to the condensation of anions. So there must be trapped massless fields. Trapped. Trapped, I mean bound to the wall. They do not propagate in the bulk. The bulk is trivially gapped. So there are trapped Nambugotson bosons on the wall. That's an immediate, immediate consequence of uh, what we're saying here. Now we have to understand which, which group manifold do they parameterize. So what's the best way to interpret between? There is, by the way, an intuitive picture. Let's imagine a sphere. Let's take the North Pole and the South Pole. Those two points are invariant under the U1 symmetry. So they're like diagonal points in our analogy. Okay. 
they are both invariant under that killing vector. But if you try to construct a domain wall between these two, you must break that symmetry. So those domain walls will also have trapped number Gaussian bosons. That's like a that's like a picture of this group manifold where you, you have two points that are invariant under some killing vector, but any configuration that interpolates between them, including the geodesic, is not. So you have to find the minimal action uh, trajectory in the group manifold interpolating between these two matrices. And a small exercise for you is to prove that the geodesic on the group manifold that interpolates between these two points uh, breaks the symmetry SUNF in the following fashion. Uh, SU and F minus 1 times U1. More precisely, the S has to be outside. That's what you find, that the symmetry is broken to NF. Basically, SU, basically UNF is broken to UNF minus 1 times U1. So that means that the matrix U as a function of Z, what minimizes the energy, is to have one eigenvalue running in one direction, and then uh, the other eigenvalues running together. So this seems to be the, this is the classical solution that minimizes the energy. It has this structure. And therefore, there is an unbroken U, SUNF minus 1 symmetry. So you could have tried to group the eigenvalues in other ways, but this seems to be the, the one that minimizes the energy. So therefore, the, on the group manifold, the Goldson bosons correspond to this symmetry breaking pattern. So this has a name. This, this coset is called the CPNF minus 1. This is the name of this coset, okay? It has a name. It has, so therefore, the number of Goldstone bosons is 2 and F minus 2. So this is the number of Goldstone bosons that are trapped to this wall. And it's exact. Uh, the, strict, the really massless fields on the wall here, even though the bulk is gapped, massive, and confining in some sense, yeah? So, but this is true. The, this number of Goldstone bosons on the wall. Right, so this is an ordinary nonlinear sigma model with this target space in two plus one dimensions. And as you know, those theories are uh, infrared free. So, there is no interesting infrared dynamics on the wall. No uh, there is no interesting infrared dynamics on the wall, except that there are exactly massless fields. There are exactly massless, two and F minus two massless fields living on this group manifold and uh, set two, okay? Exactly. So for one flavor, this story has to be revisited. And you know what happens for one flavor. Yeah, one flavor, the story is different. But there are some similarities. What do you mean? This is just classical physics. No, no. So far, I just computed the theory on the world. So let me just summarize. I haven't used any. This is just classical physics. So I took theta equals pi. I found that for large M, we get U1 level N on the wall, on the domain wall. But for masses, which are much smaller than lambda, we found a CPNF minus 1 sigma model on the domain wall. So while the bulk is smooth and does not have any phase transitions, the wall does have a phase transition taking place on its world volume. So therefore, there is a special point here, which we overlooked. There is some special point. Uh, we can put it in some color. There must be some special point here where the bulk is completely smooth, but there is a phase transition on the wall. OK? There must be such a point, even though you don't see it in the bulk. It's a so there must be a way to implement such a phase transition. And this will be perhaps one of the models that Nadi will discuss. So you see that it arises very naturally in the study of domain walls. Now let me write the model. I'll write the churn simons matter model, a churn simons theory now, which at large masses uh, leads to dead phase, and at small masses leads to dead phase. Um, and it has anions here, deconfined anions here, and the sigma model here. So it implements exactly this phase transition that you want. And the challenge for the audience is, of course, to interpret where this uh, degrees of freedom came from in full QCD. But if you embed it in a deep brain construction, it seems to come out very naturally. So let me write the model. This is just a model for this phase transition. So the Lagrangian has a U1, N, uh, U1 level N piece. 
n over 4 pi. That's the Chern-Simons matter Lagrangian from yesterday. But what we're going to add now are scalar fields, n of them, with charge 1. I'm adding an f scalar field of charge 1 under the gauge symmetry. And you can also add f squared. f squared does never matters for this thing. You can add an f squared. And now we can add a potential for the scalar fields. Okay. So this is the model. So the propagating degrees of freedom on the wall are some scalar fields with charge 1. But due to flux attachment, they become anions. And then they have some potential, which can lead to condensation. So we have to write, this is very similar to the nail VBS model, except that nail VBS is for, I guess, uh, n equals 0. So this is like a churn simons uh, uh, generalization of the nail VBS transition that Subir uh, invented or discovered. Uh, so the potential for the phi fields is taken to be some m squared. This is some three-dimensional mass. It's not the four-dimensional mass. It's related to it in some way, but we don't have the exact change of variables. Phi i squared, sum over i, plus some parameter lambda phi uh, i to the four. Sorry, phi i squared squared. This is the model. And as a three-dimensional model, it has two interesting phases. One phase is when the three-dimensional mass is positive and large. I can, I sometimes positive and large, sometimes I denote in this way. So when the three-dimensional mass is positive and large, the anions are very heavy. <coughs> there is U1 level N gauge theory, and you integrate them out, and you land on the U1 level N phase. So this leads to deconfined anions, U1 level N. Because the scalar fields are just like these probe quarks. So you see that you can describe the probe quarks in terms of scalar fields. But that's OK, because there are trans simons terms, so everything is an anion anyway. The particles have fractional spin anyway, so that's fine. The other phase of this theory is when the mass is large and negative, and then you have the Higgs mechanism. Yeah, when the mass is huge, uh, the mass squared is large and negative, the phi fields, which are the previous anions, want to condense. And the condensation of these phi fields necessarily breaks the gauge symmetry. So there is no more deconfined massless gauge, deconfined gauge fields because they are Higgs by phi. It's the same as the Higgs mechanism. They just disappear. But there are Goldstone bosons. Why? Because this Lagrangian was invariant under SUNF. So any web that you choose for these phi fields, let's say 1, 0, 0, 0, it breaks the gauge symmetry completely, but it also spontaneously breaks the global symmetry to exactly SUNF minus 1 times U1. So when the mass squared is large and negative, you find the CP and minus FNF minus 1, a sigma model. So this, uh, so this model precisely reproduces the dynamics on the wall in QCD. Let me just summarize it. We have a, a four-dimensional model that exhibits some interesting features. And we have a three-dimensional model that exhibits similar features. This is 0. So here we have u1 level n, tqft. And here we have cpnf minus 1, uh, group many, sigma model. So this is a massless phase. And this is a topological filtering phase. This whole thing, this whole model has some anomalies. And these are just two ways to saturate those anomalies, by topological field theory and the uh, sigma model. And this point zero, where the phase transition takes place, is identified with the yellow point in the four-dimensional physics. So strikingly, uh, the four-dimensional, just QCD, exhibits extremely non-trivial dynamics on the wall uh, in the universality class of this deconfined criticality with some anomalies massless fields, uh, anions, the quarks become anions, and then the quarks condense. Uh, the anion quarks condense on the wall. And so this very rich dynamic seems to be present already in QCD. And this, uh, this uh, well, motivates some uh, 3D dualities that Nari may describe. This whole story motivates some fermion boson dualities in three dimensions. Yeah. Uh, why isn't the boson boson indicated by the gauge field as a 
Well, here there is a, uh, so there are NF scalar fields. Let's ignore f the gauge symmetry for a second. <coughs> if you ignore the gauge symmetry, this is just uh, some Landau Ginzburg model where the global symmetry is a UNF, yes. not SUNF, it's going to be UNF. And then uh, this uh, symmetry breaking pattern would lead to uh, some number of Goldson bosons, of which only one can be eaten because there is only one gauge field. So you do the counting with the before gauging, then you eat one, and you would uh, be left with that number. So what becomes of the other Goldstone bosons that you can't eliminate? They're still there. They're exactly there in QCD. That's the claim. That the wall has exactly massless fields. So the claim is that the theory on the wall is in a non-trivial is in a non-trivial condensed matter language SPT phase. There is a Tooft anomaly on the wall. Of uh, on one phase it's TQFT, on the other side it's a massless sigma model. And the phase transition is in the universality class, uh, one of those universality classes that can be described by Charles Simon's matter theories. This rich structure occurs only at theta equal to pi. This rich structure occurs only at theta equals to pi. What happens here is that there is always one trivial vacuum, and that's it. Huh? No, no, for theta equals zero. For, for, uh, for, uh, well, if you change theta a little bit, uh, some of these parts, will some, st some parts of the story will still sort of survive. Because, I mean, there is some kind of uh, superheated phase you can arrange. Yeah, at theta equals zero, there is just nothing to discuss. It's a trivial theory. But the theta equals pi is an extremely rich system, which has anomalies. And due to these anomalies, the domain wall theory cannot be trivial, and the bulk cannot be trivial. The bulk has two ground states, and the domain wall theory has a rich, SPT, a rich uh, phase structure. Okay? So both the bulk and the wall are non trivial. Um, and, well, I can also mention <coughs> that I think this structure can be reproduced by, this, by constructions in ADS, which people have recently shown to some level of rigor. You can see the CPN manifold arising in ADS, you can see the U1 level N. Offer explained to me that it's hard to see the transition because it's not known how to introduce the mass parameter. But they sort of qualitatively see it uh, in ADS constructions. Any questions? The effect of the A? Uh, when the masses are very large, uh, it doesn't make any difference. If the mass of this phi is extremely large, you integrate it out. And then you have a pure Chern Simons theory with an F squared <laughs> piece. But at long distances, the F squared is irrelevant, and you just get anions. In the condensed phase, it's likewise completely irrelevant what, what, are, what do you put here. Because the gauge field is Higgs, it has a huge mass, and you just get no Goldstone bosons. So in both limits, uh, this is uh, completely irrelevant, this thing. Exactly. This is the excellent question. Can we also describe this transition in terms of a fermionic theory? And that's how this story leads to a boson-fermion duality. I'll just mention it because I'm not, one has to define precisely what it means. But it turns out that you can describe the same phase transition by, by a fermionic theory, which, peop, which uh, is sometimes uh, denoted like this. So you study some non-abelian Chern-Simons matter theory with an F fermions, with some level. And it turns out that if you analyze that theory, it has the exact same phase structure. So there is some duality between that theory and U1 level N plus a boson. Uh, NF bosons, sorry, NF bosons. This is similar. Huh? So that's why I didn't want to discuss the fermionic theory. Nari is going to explain this issue as even versus odd. One has to make sure that one has to explain what it means to write a half integer numbers here. And Nari will explain that he told me in great detail. So I didn't want to discuss that part of the duality because it's one has to define what one means by that. But there is a boson fermion duality that is uh, directly inspired by this construction. Yes. Oh, excellent question. I wanted, I didn't want to discuss that, but you can ask, does this phase know anything about N? 
Uh, who asked this question? Yeah. Does this phase know anything about the rank of the gauge group? So here the answer is similar to pion physics. In pion physics, the group manifold is S, U, and F. And it also doesn't know anything about the rank, at least at first sight. But as people have understood, the dependence on the rank comes through some wesomino witten term. So there is some kind of a higher order term in derivatives that you need to add to the Chiral Lagrangian that knows about n. So actually here, there is a wesomino witten uh, there is a Wesumino term, not Wes it should be called the Wesumino term, with coefficient n. So there is a dependence on n through some topological term that you need to add to the sigma model. And it's important for many qualitative things, such as that, you know, you can ask where are the baryons. I talked about mesons and anion condensation, but where are the baryons? So to reproduce the physics of baryons co correctly, you have to construct some skirmions and to make sure that their statistics, spin statistics is correct. You need this factor of n here. This factor of n turns them into fermions for odd n, bosons into even n, it dresses them with some flavor, quantum numbers as you need. So there's some theory of skirmions here, which is somewhat developed. Only very qualitative features are understood. Uh, but you need that, that term for various reasons. Also to match the anomalies. And is unique that term? Hmm? Let me try to remember. I think that there might be. This is it's associated to H three of C P N F minus one. Well, pi three. The Wasumino term is associated to pi three of C P N F minus one. For cl so clearly, for an F equals two, it's unique, and I am compelled to say that it's probably it's probably Z for any N F. So it's unique, yeah. Any other questions? Okay, thanks so much.